Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to say hello to all, all of those who join us online. Thank you very much for those who came in person as well. It is Friday, but still quite a few people came here despite all the restrictions. First, a few housekeeping issues. I know that many regional museums are watching us online, and uh, our speakers that I'm about to introduce, uh, some of them will have slides, some will just speak. But I hope that we will be able to answer all of the questions from our viewers, so we can give you some practical advice. So if you have any questions, Please uh, ask your questions uh, through social media, and organizers will forward them to me, and I'll ask them. And uh, so it's not just going to be my questions, but your questions as well. Let me start by introducing our guests. So these beautiful ladies sitting next to me. Daria Chudnaya, Deputy General Director of uh, Success Rockets, a private uh, company building spaceships. Anna Malinkova, she is the head of uh, the SMM department at Joseph Brodsky's museum. Then Marina Zatsepina, she is a PR specialist at the New Jerusalem Museum. And uh, Varvara Dabrilova from uh, Vladivostok branch of Tretikov Gallery. And, uh, I am actually going to have a question to you about uh, PR and museums. I used, once uh, went to Spain to my friends, and uh, uh, they uh, we, we talk about uh, Dr. Zhivago, and uh, they said that when uh, a film by the, uh, that book came out in uh, Spain, uh, a lot of Spanish people started calling their daughters uh, Laura. After, after the main heroine. I think I should go to Spain and find my namesakes. It's just uh, those my friends. They, uh, my friends had uh, a daughter named Lara, and uh, they told me this is why they called her Lara. And I forgot to say that my name is Mitri Yusuf, and I'm the moderator of this session. As I just said, many regional museums watch us online. And I hope that our today's speakers will keep this in mind, so that after this uh, 90 minutes, uh, people working in regional museums will find something useful, will learn something useful from your speeches. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce our online guest. Th these ladies are just so beautiful that I forgot everything. And Maria Seleki is uh, our online speaker. He was uh, going to come in person, but unfortunately, because of the restrictions that you all know about, he could only join us online. I have a, a number of questions to you, Maurice. So wait for them. But let me start with Anna Malinkova because uh, she is from St. Petersburg, and we are in St. Petersburg now. So le I'll let her speak first. I know that she prepared some slides. I think your museum is more present online than offline, because not many people can reach you. And uh, your museum is just one and a half rooms. It's very small. Perhaps not everyone is familiar with your museum, so maybe you can say a couple of words about the, the story behind this museum. I remember there was a woman living there, and uh, she said uh, that she knew Brodsky personally, but she was uh, against the museum. And now uh, the neighbors uh, of this museum are complaining that too many people come there. OK, I'll tell you a few words about that as well. Uh, hello, uh, that lady who uh, didn't want the museum to happen. She's still living there. She uh, She's an old lady, so she was born in 1936, and she is, has been living in this apartment 
all her life. Uh, since late 1990s, uh, we started trying to make a museum in his apartment uh, just after he died. We bought out four or five rooms uh, of this communal flat. and. Uh, uh, but this lady, she lived in the last room, and uh, she didn't want a museum there. So it's quite uh, poetic. And she said, I'm an old tree, and old, an old tree cannot be uprooted. I want to die where I was born. And uh, I can understand her. I don't want to antagonize her. I don't want to say that she was like a horrible person. Uh, just personally, I can understand her. her. So Brodsky just lived there and uh, read uh, his poems uh, in the next room, and uh, his friends came came there. Then he became uh, the Nobel Prize winner, and uh, he emigrated. But she she lives there. She cooks there, and and uh, it's just her normal life. And uh, some all of a sudden, twenty people come and say, "Is is this the lady who knew Brodsky?" So and her name is uh, Nina, and uh, we actually resolved the issue together. Uh, she uh, offered to buy out and the next apartment and uh, to make one apartment out of two, but uh, to leave this room, this old lady's room, out of it. So make this room into a one-room apartment. Uh, this way, uh, this is what we did, and this way we got more space uh, just to, to accommodate more people, to tell about Brodsky's life. And uh, then, uh, so just people just, uh, first walk th through other rooms, and then at the end of the tour, uh, these are one and a half rooms where Brodsky lived. I think this story is so wonderful, so poetic, that even if it didn't happen, you should have invented it. Uh, right now, we have some issues with other neighbors, because the entrance to the museum is through, is, uh, through a staircase used by all the uh, people living there. But it's going to change because we're going to have a new entrance from the first floor. There's going to be a small shop there and a coffee room, coffee shop. So this is going to be resolved. But as of now, people have to walk through the common entrance and uh, people living there, they don't quite like it. But uh, I think uh, their concerns are just a PR campaign for us. We just need to react in the right way. But we try to make it as convenient as possible for both sides. I have some pre uh, I have a presentation, so I'm going to start showing it. Joseph Brodsky's museum is a literary museum, and uh, such museums are often perceived even more boring than just museums in general. And uh, uh, I think there are some reasons for that. Literary museums usually exhibit very simple, everyday things that were used in the, in the house of a poet or a writer. They don't have any particular value as of themselves any artistic value. These are just things that were around that person. And uh, most often, uh, literary museums uh, build their storytelling around the biography of the person, of the writer or a poet. And they don't all, always include stories about uh, some works, some literary works, and how they are connected to the life of the author. Sometimes uh, this is lacking. So we see uh, how a person lived, we, we see a certain time period, like a time capsule, but we don't learn much about the poetry or novels of the person whose house we're visiting. And this uh, makes uh, the work of literary museums more complicated. So first, the concept needs to be streamlined. For example, we uh, used a completely different approach to the preparation of our exhibition. The most important thing for us is emptiness that uh, Brodsky left behind in his one and a half rooms. In one of his essays, he wrote that 
uh, it's like a, a bomb exploded uh, in his rooms. But the, the bomb is a time bomb that uh, didn't spare anything. So now the, the room looks a little bit like an, in shambles. And this, again, is a reference to his poetry uh, about what and how he wrote. And uh, after we decided on the concept, we can tell this story and uh, to attract people because of this unusual concept. And uh, the first thing we did uh, so that people would know about our museum is uh, we assembled a team. The team includes, first of all, Anna Narinskaya, our chief curator. I can't switch the slides. Anna Narinskaya, she has a connection to Joseph Brodsky, just by birth. She is the daughter of uh, Yevgeny Rein, and uh, she was brought up by uh, another person, and both of them are friends of Brodsky. And uh, her guardian was a secretary of Anna Akhmatova, so her family has very close personal connection to our museum. And uh, Anna Narinska is also a curator, a writer, and uh, she uh, organizes many exhibitions in Moscow, very high profile, very famous ones. Uh, so she already has uh, quite an audience, quite a following. And just by joining our project, she brought many people to us, uh, especially from Moscow. Uh, on her Facebook page, uh, where she has a lot of follow followers, she writes about her life. And uh, she, she writes quite well. It's e very easy to read, uh, funny, engaging, or moving. And uh, she, of course, also writes about this project after she joined our museum. So she started talking about her job. And uh, this isn't uh, an, uh, it's not an advertisement in its form. It's just a very personal, very lively story, and many people become interested just through her, through her personality. And uh, this was uh, very important for us. We are very glad to have her in our team. Our architect is Alexander Brodsky. He's also a very prominent person. He is an artist and one of the founding people in the paper architecture movement. He is not a public person. He doesn't have any social media accounts. He doesn't write much. He doesn't give interviews often. But uh, uh, he, this mysterious person, and, uh, just because of his silence in the media, also attracts people to us. People want to look at his new project. These are the people. Another thing that is, of course, a very, very important for the museum is uh, merchandise. Being a literary museum, we primarily work with quotes, with words. And uh, Brodsky had one peculiar characteristic. His uh, poems can be easily just picked apart and used as quotes. He has very, uh, very uh, famous catchy phrases, and uh, they are easily remembered. But uh, when you take them out of context, out of a poem, they start sounding different. They lose their initial meaning and become maybe quite too, quite lofty, and uh, it is important to walk the line, not to become like, like, uh, too base. So we produce some merchandise with his quotes, but uh, it is always limited. And we try not to use the most obvious, the most well-known quotes. 
then sometimes quite prominent people, people who are important for us and our audience, uh, wear them. For instance, Artur Bezchastny here on the picture, uh, he act, uh, he played the role of Brodsky in the film called Davlatov. So he is in our cap here. He came to us one day and we gifted him this uh, this hat. And uh, then people uh, started reaching out uh, to us for, uh, through Instagram saying, uh, is it your cap? Uh, do, do you produce it? Can we buy it from you? We saw it on Anton. And uh, uh, maybe uh, first people encounter a quote, and then they read the entire poem, and then they want to read more and want to come to the museum. Apart from such uh, merchandise, we also have a limited line. That is a bit more complicated. Here is a picture of Anna Narinskaya uh, with a with a T-shirt with a, an image of a book. Uh, this is a book cover published in the U.S. and uh, this uh, publishing house in, Amer in America published Russian books that were prohibited in the Soviet Union. If you wanted to read Brodsky in the Soviet times, one option was uh, to uh, to you, you find uh, some samizdat. So when you just typed the poems yourself or someone else, and you, so you compile a book. Another option is to find a book that was published abroad, uh, or so-called tam is that. And uh, now we have uh, this line of uh, T-shirts so with this book cover, for instance, uh, showing how uh, it was published back then. And this is another example. Uh, it's still in production now. So this is an example of uh, some is that. And you can see the entire poem here, so, so self-published, self-typed. So from from a distance you can't see it, it's just something unusual, interesting, but when you stand up close you can read the entire poem and uh, here you see, so the lines are quite long, so it's just a regular poem, it's not just one quote out of context. It was important for us to print it in the entirety, so the meaning is exactly as uh, Joseph Brodsky intended it. And the design is very simple because the design is not the most important thing. The important thing is the idea so that nothing else distracts from the poem. And of course, I must mention social media. Uh, our main platform is Instagram. And uh, I think it is very important to, main, to maintain a balance between popularization and uh, education. The most popular posts are posts with, with uh, Joseph Brodsky's photos and uh, his uh, poems. This is the simplest option, but we can't do without it. And it's important for people. We uh, publish such posts. and uh, sometimes something more intellectual. But we also try to include little bits and pieces of uh, personal stories from, from our point of view. And I think in uh, uh, St. Petersburg, I think one of the most uh, successful Instagram accounts is uh, a bookshop called Podpisne is Dania. Their Instagram account is uh, very popular and uh, there uh, people working in the shop, uh, they tell their stories, what they're reading, what they like. They also make uh, photo sessions and they pose as some uh, characters from books. But it is very popular because they bring a personal touch. So you see who is behind all the work in the bookshop. And uh, it is very important for our audience. So when a person comes to the museum, he or she would see not just a, like a monument, but he would see a, a person, a live person. 
This is why we try to include our team into our Instagram. And during the last lockdown, we had a project where some people from our team uh, talked about their most favorite, favorite books about Joseph Brodsky. And it was just their words, their opinions, very, very personal opinion. While you switch the slides, let me just make a general comment. Yesterday, I talked to a friend of mine uh, who has an SMM agency. I know that he, he is watching right now. And, uh, uh, I looked at uh, both uh, regional museums and uh, large museums, and with, I think that most museums use Instagram as the main platform. I can't be sure. Uh, we looked uh, from September 1st until yesterday. So we looked at uh, social media accounts. And the uh, Tretikov Gallery is one of the leaders in terms of popularity. But uh, we just look at uh, which museum has which social media. Some have um, Twitter, but uh, we see that the most engaged with one is Instagram. Uh, Facebook as well, and VK, but much much less. I think VK has a very different audience. It's not quite our audience. But I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong. We also have uh, Telegram channels, for instance. And I want our museum to have it, its own Telegram ch channel. I think it will, I hope it will happen. Are you going to post something different there? Because I think many museums are thinking about uh, branching out into other channels, other media. What's going to be different between Instagram and Telegram? I think uh, in Instagram, the main thing is the photo, the image. And for instance, the Hermitage Museum's uh, Instagram account is very successful. and. The, uh, Yuri Molotkovets is uh, the person is behind this account, and he is a photographer. So the most important thing there is how he makes pictures in Hermitage. This is the first thing, not the text. But we try to maintain a balance between the picture and the words. But when I look at other Instagram accounts of other museums, I see that uh, many literary museums pay less attention to the photo. And it is also quite difficult sometimes to merge maybe different events into one visual presentation. And uh, for instance, they want to announce an event and they have a picture of, of this event. But uh, when you look at many pictures together, it doesn't work cohesively. But I think uh, these are just some artistic searches that every museum makes. This is what I wanted to say about social media. Another very important thing for us are the events that we organize. We try to invite people who, whose presence in itself would be an, an event for St. Petersburg, so it would be meaningful. For instance, we had Dmitry Krimov at our museum recently. He had a dialogue. He is a theater director. I think many of you know him. So there was a dialogue with Dmitry Krimov and the director of our museum. And just to, to come and uh, to hear him in person uh, is quite significant, because our lectorium is quite small. So everyone is quite close to each other. And we can organize such intimate gatherings. So such. Uh, events uh, are quite prominent, quite important. And Anatoly Nyman, uh, he rarely comes to St. Petersburg, he lives in Moscow, and he came to us, to our museum. It was also quite an event here. Just made, made a lecture, a speech at our museum. I'm almost at the end, at the end of my presentation. We try, uh, we try to always make something happen in our museum. There is always something going on. And because of that, uh, media often mentions us. For instance, at the end of October, we had a tour uh, around the construction site. So it was the first time 
when we showed people and showed media representatives what is going to happen at the first floor. And so we presented our plans. And uh, right after that, you know, some articles were published about the museum. And uh, this, in turn, again, attracts new people to our museum. And the idea of having a bookshop and a small bar and uh, combining all of it with the museum is quite unusual. But uh, it, it seems important to us, and just, just in terms of uh, the Museum of Joseph Brodsky. Here, this uh, photo, you see our sign. It's going to be called the end of the beautiful era. And uh, another, another sign reads books, uh, coffee, whis whiskey, and uh, tobacco, things that Brodsky loved. And uh, these are things that are going away. So people read e-books rather than paper books. And uh, coffee, whiskey, tobacco, it's not uh, in line with healthy lifestyle that is popular now. But these are things that were popular for Brodsky uh, and important for him. So it's a little bit nostalgic. But we like it, and we want to tell people about it. I think uh, this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And uh, as before, I urge our online users, uh, viewers, ask questions. And you can leave them in the chat, or if you're physically present, you can raise your hand. And I, actually, I see a raised hand, so please introduce yourself first. My name is Vladislav. Um, the question is about communication channels. Social media are uncontrolled uh, communication channels. Your social media account can be banned or suspended, and you cannot do anything about it. Do you have any backup plans, backup communication channels? Well, honestly, we hope that we won't be banned. But uh, if one media account is banned, another media account can appear. It's, it's not so difficult. The information just has to go somewhere. And if it cannot go to Instagram, it will go to Facebook and then go to Telegram. What's the institutional status of your museum? It's a private, private museum. I liked your presentation. It was very um, intelligent and um, rather delicate. And I like what you did with the mu museum. What is the, the general goal of your museum? I mean, what do you want to achieve? Uh, more visitorship or what? Our goal is to educate people about Brodsky. So educational goal and we don't have a visitorship problems so far we now have all 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 the tickets are sold out by until december the first and we cannot by law admit too many people per day because of the neighbors uh, so that we don't bother them so the visitorship is uh, restricted. So I'd say that our main goal is education. Morris is, uh, looks a, a bit um, bored. So um, I'm going to give the floor to Morris. at all because I'm very honored uh, to, uh, to be a guest uh, at uh, your program. Um, my name is uh, Maurice Seleki from the Amsterdam Museum. Uh, I'm here in Amsterdam and I would have loved to come to St. Petersburg, but uh, unfortunately due to the COVID uh, crisis, it wasn't possible, but I'm glad to be here digitally. Um, um, so I will take you uh, in uh, to this presentation to Amsterdam and to the Netherlands, uh, giving you a, a small uh, insight uh, in our conversational campaign for the Golden Coach, Couch. And that's the royal carriage of uh, the King of the Netherlands. 
So one more time, uh, a small introduction. My name is Moritz Seleki. I'm a head of communications and marketing at the Amsterdam Museum, also a member of the management team there, and also a member of the storytelling team uh, of the exhibition, The Golden Coach. Uh, the Amsterdam Museum is founded in 1926, and it tells the story about the history, the present and the future of Amsterdam. It's the official city museum of Amsterdam, and we're located in the city center of, uh, of Amsterdam, we have actually like a complex of more than 25 historical buildings uh, and we're presenting there um, over a hundred thousand uh, different objects from the history of uh, Amsterdam and uh, in the pre-COVID year 2019 uh, we attracted uh, uh, more than 170,000 uh, visitors uh, to uh, the museum. And these visitors actually are people from the Netherlands but also a lot of international visitors. Um, uh, the, actually, very recently we were nominated for the shortlist of the Dutch National Museum Prize 2021. And that's a, a great honor for us because we're on a shortlist with two other museums. And in December we are going to hear the outcome of this uh, also election. So people in the Netherlands can now vote uh, for the best museum of uh, 2021. And of course we hope that we, we will be uh, that museum. But we are honored with uh, the, the shortlist uh, already. Um, this presentation is about the Golden Coach. And the Golden Coach is a carriage owned and used by the Dutch royal family. Um, for instance, at the annual celebrations around the speech of the throne. Uh, it was a gift of the citizens of Amsterdam for the investi investiture of Queen uh, Wilhelmina in 1898. Uh, and uh, Queen Wilhelmina was uh, one of the ancestors of our uh, current King William Alexander. And this uh, coach, this carriage, uh, went into renovation in 2015. And actually it uh, went into renovation for more than five years. Um, the coach, the carriage is uh, consist considered as contested heritage. And that's mainly because of the use uh, of the coach uh, with this door, this panel that you see, called the Tribute of the Colonies. So at this point there's much public debate in the Netherlands, can we with this presentation of people of color, um, representing people of the former colonies of the Netherlands, can we still use this royal carriage with this, um, with this panel on uh, the door? Uh, after the five years of renovation, uh, the king, uh, who is the, the owner and the user and also the lender of the golden carriage, uh, lended out his carriage uh, for a big exhibition at our museum, an Amsterdam museum, um, that opened up in uh, June, last June uh, of the summer. And he lended it out to our museum because we are the Amsterdam museum and what I already told, uh, this uh, carriage was a present, a gift, of the people of Amsterdam to uh, his uh, great 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 grandmother, Queen uh, Wilhelmina. Um, let's talk about the campaign. Even before the um, before the exhibition opened, we uh, actually uh, received lots of uh, media attention, uh, both in the Netherlands but also uh, abroad. This is a publication from the New York Times, for example. And, um, and of course, it has a lot, uh, the media attention has uh, a lot of, uh, is, is because it is such an important uh, uh, object. Uh, lots of people in the Netherlands uh, see the carriage as like a, a mirror of Dutch society and the changes in society of the last 150 years also. Uh, so uh, we gathered uh, lots of publications and, uh, and, and still actually are gathering uh, publications because uh, there are lots of angles that journalists use to uh, tell us, uh, tell news stories about uh, this uh, exhibition. For our outdoor campaign um, that has uh, been seen in Amsterdam but also in the rest of the Netherlands, we've made a campaign image that you can see here that uses uh, the image of the, uh, the coach but also um, uh, shows the, the, the carriage in exploded view. And that's like a metaphor of, uh, of our campaign team to, sh to show the audience, the public, that uh, we try to uh, present all the different aspects, all the different layers, all the different stories that uh, has to do with uh, the history and the use and the 
um, the public debate around the golden uh, uh, coach. So it's like a metaphor uh, uh, in this exploded uh, view. So you can see it here. But we also have posters when uh, the when the whole carriage is is one piece again. So we have like three different uh, posters. Um, so everybody can 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 see that we are trying also to reconstruct the complete story of the uh, of of the coach. Um, what we also did is developed a, a special digital platform um, around this whole project where we uh, tell uh, more stories about the the background uh, of the exhibition uh, and the background of the the carriage but also present the outcome of uh, a research uh, project that we connect to this whole exhibition. So in this uh, magazine area, you can uh, read all kinds of uh, in-depth content, interviews, essays, background stories. But also we publish there um, a, a series of 31 minute uh, documentaries. I will show you a teaser of, uh, of the series. And in that uh, mini documentaries, we ask scientists, uh, artists, and all kinds of other experts to give their reflections on the Golden Coach. Nou, we gaan er gewoon gelijk voor. Het is belangrijk om de Gouden Koets kritisch te bekijken. Omdat in het licht van deze tijd er natuurlijk wel wat vragen zijn uh, te beantwoorden. De Gouden Koets staat voor mij symbool voor... Ja, jeugdsentiment wel. Dat prachtige ding op de televisie. Poppenkast. Natuurlijk, poppenkast. Kolonialisme. Het is gewoon heel erg mooi. We will ask where did the good come from? <laughs> Leukste koning dat ziet. <laughs> de Gouden Koets. <laughs> dat moet je verder niet opnemen, maar skip deze even. Ja. <laughs> Ik zou gewoon zeggen, kom mijn werk gewoon checken. <laughs> So here you can see the um, exploded view of the coach uh, again. And also for our Russian friends, um, so everybody in the Netherlands knows this object. So that's that's why everybody has an opinion uh, on this, uh, because it's uh, it's the carriage of the of the king. We also created an extensive radio campaign uh, for this whole project on the Dutch national radio. And of course, um, we have, have done lots of things on social media, especially on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and LinkedIn. Um, actually, uh, we are uh, uh, just currently active on TikTok. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that we, we didn't use TikTok uh, yet for the campaign for the Golden Couch. But what we see is that lots of people, because everybody knows this carriage, have an opinion and want to interact with the museum uh, about uh, this uh, exhibition. Um, I already mentioned the research project, and that's very interesting, I think, uh, because we are trying to take this whole conversation about this exhibition and this object. Uh, not only um, we want to uh, um, have a dialogue in the museum, but also outside of the museum. So what you see here is a mobile research uh, installation that we take on tour in, uh, to all the big cities of the Netherlands. Uh, and in this uh, installation, uh, we try to, um, to engage with the general public uh, about the Golden Coach. So everybody can uh, leave their comments, their uh, feelings, their opinions, their visions uh, 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 about this, uh, this piece of heritage uh, at our mobile research on, uh, installation. And we're still we're still continuing this tour, and we are collecting all these data, all these uh, uh, comments of the general public uh, in uh, uh, in this way. And people can leave uh, their comments in um, in multimedia uh, way. So uh, if you you see here this you see this installation, and people can leave their comments by means of video, for example. So these are all people who are giving their own comments on the future uh, and the, uh, of the Golden Coach. And this uh, research project is also a form of campaigning because uh, uh, lots of media are actually um, writing about uh, our tour uh, during the Netherlands, of, in the Netherlands. So it's creating a buzz in the media uh, also. 
Um, what we've done to, um, to, uh, to add to the uh, qualitative research from the mobile research installation is also a quantitative, a quantitative research project. And uh, so we collaborated with Motivection, that's a renowned Dutch research uh, agency, um, to conduct a quantitative research um, project about the, the opinions of the Dutch uh, people before the exhibition started. So, for example, we asked uh, to people how many of the Dutch people have seen the golden carriage a real, uh, in real life in their lives. And 87% uh, uh, of the people said, uh, uh, I didn't see the golden carriage in my own life, only on television. But we also asked uh, to the people is, what do you think that should be done with the golden carriage? Should the king just drive every year in a golden carriage after this exhibition uh, finished, uh, or should it put it in a museum? And two thirds of the Dutch audience said, oh, the king uh, could just use the golden carriage. Uh, I, th I think it's a Dutch tradition, just continue to use the, the golden carriage. But one third of the people we asked said, no, you cannot use the uh, golden carriage anymore. You should put it in a museum. So that was before the exhibition opened. And what we are trying to do uh, after the exhibition, we're going to follow up this, uh, or, uh, this, this uh, inquiry with motivation and ask if pe the Dutch people, the Dutch audience, Dutch people uh, are, um, have, have changed their minds. So if they have changed their minds, we can uh, um, assume that it is because of our uh, exhibition and the whole project that we did. So there, in this way, we can um, measure the impact of our whole project. And of course, this is the Dutch King here on the left. Um, after the exhibition, we want to present all the collected data. So from our mobile research installation, but also uh, from uh, the comments that people leave inside of the museum uh, when they uh, uh, visit the exhibition, but also the motivation, quantitative research uh, project, what I already said. Um, and all this data we're going to present to the general public uh, and also uh, to the king and his advisors. And it is very uh, exciting because uh, the king has said, uh, I don't know how I will use the golden carriage in the future. I will think about it. I will wait until this exhibition is finished in February, and then I will make up my mind. So with all this data that we collected, maybe it will uh, influence the king. So it's very, very exciting. Um, and, and, and that's why we also call this a conversational campaign, because we're trying to uh, uh, organize public dialogue around national heritage uh, in a very interactive way, where we try to connect with uh, as many as people as we can. To finish up uh, my uh, talk, I just wanted to show you uh, the trailer that we made um, to attract the general audience to visit the exhibition. And also in the trailer, you can see it's like a, a, a like a small movie. You can also see the the concept of the exploded view. So all the bits and parts um, of the um, of the golden carriage representing the different storylines, the different uh, angles and perspectives on this uh, this very interesting piece of national uh, royal Dutch heritage. And this is a, a small movie, and then uh, we can... Um...
Yeah, so uh, thank you so much. And I would uh, invite everybody uh, in, uh, who, can, who is visiting Amsterdam uh, also to visit our museum. Uh, when you want to uh, hear more from uh, the, the history uh, and the present uh, of, uh, of Amsterdam. Um, so everybody's uh, welcome. And uh, if you want to find our website, just go to www.amsterdammuseum.nl. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you very much. I have a question. The Amsterdam Museum uh, is in a building where there used to be an orphan orphanage. And uh, the, I know that your, your museum uh, has a program about that, and there are some city tours about that. And I have a question. Why did you choose the Golden Coach for your presentation? Why this project is so important to you right now? The presentation. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your question. And you're totally right. Uh, we are, we're, the, the, our building uh, was uh, uh, four, 400 years in the orphanage for girls and for boys, and since 1975, it uh, uh, it houses uh, the city museum, so our museum. Um, why I uh, 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 um, give this presentation is because this is our current uh, main exhibition, uh, the Golden Coach, and um, yeah, in, the, in the, uh, the the example of this uh, conversational approach that we are trying to uh, uh, to uh, conduct on both exhibition and in the campaign was uh, something that I uh, thought could be inspiring for other museums and especially also uh, uh, for, for you in Russia. Thank you. We also have another question. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I was so glad, and I think my colleagues as well, that there is an exhibition of one piece, and uh, it is uh, followed by so many events. And how do you calculate the effectiveness of your project? Or what is your KPI? Uh, or what, 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 what do you count, like the revenue from the ticket sales or something else? Yeah, uh, also very interesting question. Uh, we had a target, uh, a visitor target, of, uh, to reach uh, 150,000 uh, people uh, in the, during the, 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 the campaign period and also the exhibition period to attract 150,000 people, uh, opening in June uh, and uh, closing up in February of this year. Unfortunately, because of Corona, we've uh, we've seen that uh, that we were gonna, not going to reach that target of visitors. But um, we know that uh, we can uh, contribute that to the, co the COVID uh, crisis because in the Netherlands, uh, the whole cultural sector uh, sees uh, see the visitor uh, 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 rates uh, uh, dropping. So we know and we can also uh, explain that to our funders and to uh, the government and the municipality who are uh, supporting this project that, uh, that, that our KPI on visitors isn't reached. But um, we uh, also uh, have some other uh, KPIs. So uh, what we, um, for example, for the mobile research installation, we want to uh, speak with at least uh, 100 uh, people uh, every time that we are going out on tour. And that uh, target is, is, is in our grasp. And also, uh, I've shown you one of, of the teaser of the mini documentaries. Uh, we have online uh, viewing targets, so uh, we can we have made 30 uh, one-minute documentaries. So uh, we see that uh, that the targets for our digital uh, audience are uh, being uh, 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 met. So we have like different uh, KPIs, and of course, in the end, we have the the the, the motivation. Uh, data report, the follow-up of our uh, uh, qualitative of quantitative research, and um, and that's also like an impact uh, measurement at the end of the whole pro project. Thank you. Now let's travel to Vladivostok. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Why did you decide? Oh, okay, I have four questions to you. Well, I'll try to stick to three questions, but maybe I'll give you five. 
First, why did you decide to have a branch of your museum in Vladivostok? How did you agree to it? What is happening right now? And how do you interact with the locals? What do they think about your project? So these are my questions to you. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you, uh, dear colleagues, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, it is fascinating to see some specific cases from other museums. Uh, for two years, I've been working on establishing a branch of Tretyakov Gallery in Vladivostok. Currently, we also have a branch under construction in Samara. It is quite fast. This project is go moving on fast. Next year, we're going to open. Another branch is in Kaliningrad and another one in Vladivostok. This uh, was a decision by the government, and uh, I think it is to help the infrastructure uh, and culture of these cities. Uh, they have one thing in common. Two cities are on the seashore and one on Volga, so a lot of water around there. Uh, this is quite an ambitious project, ambitious project, but I was enthusiastic to take it on. And uh, we see similar examples. Uh, for instance, the Hermitage has branches both in other Russian cities and abroad. And to us, to Tretyakov Gallery, this is something completely new. And we believe that uh, our collection is beloved by Russians, and uh, it is perceived as an important part of our cultural code. And uh, we very much hope that these new branches in three Russian cities will be uh, popular. But uh, it is quite difficult for us right now to decide how to uh, like, uh, translate this Tretyakov gallery imagery because it is very distinct. How can it uh, be reproduced somewhere else? So we have a lot of work ahead of us. And we also look at our European and American colleagues, those who also go this globalization route. But we want to combine global and local so that each city would have their own Tretyakov gallery and uh, that in each city it will maybe meet some yet unspecified demands. I also wanted to say a few words about marketing. I don't have much time. Uh, so I have two questions to my colleagues. First, what role, structurally speaking, marketing plays in your museums? Uh, I used to be in marketing for five or six years, and I believe that marketing is everything. And, uh, uh, because there are some departments uh, in museums that work with product, like educational pro projects, some tours, or so something else. And another completely different sphere is marketing. And uh, at a certain time, I thought that marketing also deals with product, so it is like, the most important thing. And uh, I believe that uh, right now in Tretyakov Gallery we have many promotional projects, but uh, a very important part of our marketing is uh, to communicate with uh, visitors at each point from the idea of visiting a museum, from the ticket office, security check. Uh, so we have a department welcoming guests. And uh, I believe that uh, the marketing is good when it uh, is involved in all these points of contact. But uh, it's not easy when when you want to do it in reality. When you go to the uh, accounting department and say, you know, uh, ticket returns should be different, and marketing will help you with that. But just in terms of strategy, uh, I think it's better to, to to look at all these aspects. We can't we can even not call it marketing. We can call it like service or something else. But uh, this is what we try to. Uh, to to tell people to through all our behavior. Uh, this is unseen work, but uh, there is this true marketing that uh, creates the entire brand of the museum through all these aspects. So this is my first question about what uh, is the place of marketing. 
And another question is about museums as safe spaces. And right now we are flooded with fake news and some dubious information, but we want to believe that people still trust museums because museums are islands of truth, of uh, honest and serious discussion. And I wanted to ask my colleagues uh, their opinion. Is it so? And are there some tools of, for museums to uphold their status of sta safe spaces? Uh, where any discussion is welcome. I loved how my uh, Dutch colleague said uh, like museum is involved in this uh, public dialogue and I hoped that uh, w one of your questions will be uh, what is your opinion about the royal family? But uh, you didn't go that far. But uh, I am very much interested to know, uh, in current reality, how museums can moderate such difficult discussions, and what can we do with our internal censorship and external censorship, and how can we behave uh, in this uh, public dialogue and be a safe and uh, sound uh, interlocutor? I think in our speeches we will answer these questions. So my question to you, what happens in Vladivostok? Right now we are making the project of the building. We're designing the building. We work with foreign designers and architects. For the past two years, we worked in three areas so that by the time the building is complete, when the uh, ribbon is cut, people would already be standing at the entrance and they would be waiting for the, the doors to open and that the people who come already know what we are about. This is why we um, have events in three areas. First is educational program for students and um, we hope that some of these students will become our employees. We had a BA and now we have an MA uh, in local university. The second area is uh, including ourselves into the professional community in Vladivostok. We conduct workshops, we participate in local festivals. We try to, like, to get to know the area, Sakhalin and uh, the, the area around. And the third area is uh, mass events for, like, for everybody and some education pro programs for anyone who's interested. This is what we're going to continue until the building is completed. Why did you agree to head this branch in Vladivostok? Well, I started by saying that marketing is everything. And I thought I know everything I need to know to govern this project. It was an inspiring, interesting project for me. I wanted to be involved into a project from ground zero uh, and to look at it as an entire organism. And uh, I, I fell in love with uh, the city, with Vladivostok. I haven't been there before the project, but right now I think I've been there 20 times and counting. I have a question to you. I know that you uh, study your audience, your visitors in Tretikov Gallery in Moscow. Do you do this in Vladivostok? Do you study your potential audience? No, so far, no. We just uh, walk around and try to get to know as many people as possible. Here at the Moscow Tretikov Gallery, I sometimes walked up to some unusual looking people and uh, I wanted to I just ask them, why did you come to the museum today? And uh, who are these unusual looking people? With green hair? No, th those are quite, quite usual. Once there was a woman with uh, like three toddlers and uh, a baby, like a newborn baby in her arms. And uh, I was a young mother back then, and uh, I just approached her carefully in the cafe and I said, please excuse me for bothering you, but why did you decide to go to the museum? And she said, well, I was quite busy when I was pregnant and then I was in a hospital, and right now I just want to film like I am a regular, normal person again. And uh, it just highlights that visiting a museum is a very important thing for the society. And about 80% of people go to our gallery not alone, just in a company with friends or with relatives. And uh, so it is an important component, component of public life.
We have a question from the audience. Hello. I am from Angarsk city, uh, and I represent a museum of uh, watches or clocks. You started speaking about marketing. Uh, the state now helps museums by publishing a Pushkin map a template. Uh, did it influence your work, your indicators, uh, specifically in Tretyakov Gallery? Oh, just I, I'm interested to know from all of you. We didn't feel like more people started coming, but we, like, we did a lot to introduce this map. And we introduced some new technical things, but we didn't see any growth in visitation numbers. This it's Pushkin card, and we didn't see uh, also we didn't see any spikes in visitor numbers. But we saw that many young people who come now, they are they, I think, uh, are now more uh, thoughtful. Uh, they say, well, now I have this card and I can visit museums, and they don't want just to go at random. They want to uh, make a conscious choice where to spend this card. So some people have to come to the museum, like school children. They have a tour with their cl classmates, but the Sapushkin card is voluntary. And you, you were right. Uh, despite any technical glitches, it was launched throughout the country very fast. But it doesn't. It didn't influence the number of visitors. But I think it uh, changed the quality of visitors because now people are more conscious about planning their visiting museums. And. Uh, do you think that in the future this Pushkin card uh, will bring more people into museums? Your personal opinion. Uh, so, like people ages 18 to 24. Uh, in 2019, at the last cultural forum, uh, it was said that these are the people who visit museums least. Do you th do you believe that this card will stimulate people going to museums? I am also from a regional museum, so let me answer your question. Uh, in our museum, we also didn't see any growing number of visitors, but we are philosophical. We looked at our work, and uh, okay, we agree, yes, this uh, age group, 18 to 24, they are the, few, the, the, the fewest, the smallest group. We don't see uh, like a wave of visitors, and it's hard to, for com hard to compete for us. So one more question. Let me go back to Vladivostok and Tretyakov Gallery. You are also from there? No, I'm from Tolyati, next to Samara, where another branch of Tretyakov Gallery is going to open. And, uh, Oh, when they came to Samara, they just uh, had a gala dinner. So they tried to win us through our stomachs. Will you do something like that in Vladivostok? Uh, no, uh, you're right that the building we're using in Samara, it used to be a, a canteen. Uh, so we we try to honor the heritage of the building, and that's why there was a dinner, a reception. But uh, in Vladivostok, we're we're building a new, a new building from scratch. So we can do whatever we want. There's going to be a museum, and a Hermitage Center is going to be there as well. They're going to have one hall. We're also going to have a partnership program with the Russian Museum, with the Oriental Museum, and the other regional museums. The neighboring building is the second stage of Mariinsky Theater in Vladivostok. And another building uh, is a branch of a St. Petersburg uh, Theater Academy. So the concept is uh, of this continuity and the like, Gesamtkunstwerk. And uh, nearby, at the Ruski Island, there's going to be a branch of the musical school and the choreography school. So from from the earliest age, people were going to be immersed in culture. Daria, now we go to you. 
Since this year, you are Vice Director General of Success Rockets. Then, before that, you used to work in the uh, Space Museum. I visited it as a school kid, uh, but uh, now I see a new wave of interest to space and space exploration. Uh, maybe it's due to Elon Musk. But our actors, for instance, went to space recently to shoot a film, and uh, it was received like with mixed reviews. But uh, I looked at the, the stories, the coverage from Western media, and uh, for instance, Financial Times made uh, a report. They published a photo on their front page, a photo of our actors in space. So why space, Daria? Thank you. And actually, I want to say so much and answer so many questions. Uh, what Lara mentioned, I'll try to fit everything in 10 minutes, and then we'll see how it goes. Well, thank you for introducing me as a person who works in a private space corporation, because before that, I was the head of uh, the uh, PR office of the Russian Cos uh, Cosmonautics Museum. It's a state museum, uh, space museum. Uh, but uh, I'm, I work in a private entity now. So I am both a person who knows the, uh, the way museum works and uh, as represent a company which is interested in working with museums. So from both sides. Now, museum is figures. The uh, Space Museum, the Cosmonautics Museum, is located in Moscow in, in VDNH. That's the uh, exhibition for the achievements of uh, um, uh, economic achievements. That's from Soviet legacy. Um, you know, sometimes people say, Yes, you're a large Moscow museum, you can afford this or that, but uh, from museum's point of view, um, what I'm going to talk about uh, required no financial investments. It was all about the idea and about engaging with partners and to work on this idea. So what I mean is it doesn't matter how big or small you are, it's all do doable. Now, a couple of words about the Space Museum, because marketing is about figures. Um, visitorship from uh, in the last five years. Well, we, we don't talk about 2020, um, so the figures are until 2019. You can see them on the slide, on the screen. And the uh, initiatives that I'm going to mention actually increased, helped to increase the visitorship. All projects that we were doing with the museum need to be followed up. And once a, an interesting project is implemented, you can go one step further and uh, you can apply for an, uh, uh, for an, uh, an award of sorts. And, uh, Please do that. This way, you'll get more media attention, uh, more buzz, and this uh, award application is another tool for people to know about you. So the first project I'm going to mention is uh, International Space Station. And how did we do this? We did this in partnership with VK.com. Lots has been said about social media. So this was done with uh, VK social media and with Roscosmos, Russian Space Agency. Our goal was to engage with younger audience and then get them interested in space and the Space Museum. Show them that the real heroes in this world are our cosmonauts. And we made a, a scientific show and we invited celebrities such as bloggers uh, artists actors directors singers various celebrities who had to go through space related 
challenges and uh, trials, and uh, it was all shot in the building of the museum. And then we agreed with Roscosmos we could give uh, these people a chance to talk to the uh, cosmonauts in the International Space Station live, so right here, right now. And uh, there were many celebrities, major celebrities, and um, who, when they realized that they can talk to people in space, uh, they were happy like children. And uh, it was so genuine that uh, the viewers were also very much engaged and this way they learned a lot about the museum because there were geo geotags and notifications that uh, it's made in the space museum and uh, the there were two seasons 16 episodes with more than 1.5 views per episode now a, cu a couple of words about the people who came to us we used all the tools and uh, available to us. If you see that you can talk about your museum here, you can talk about, and you need to talk about your museum here. And um, people were writing about us. They were uh, posting news about us with uh, hashtags and geotags, and uh, the, the impact was great. I'm sorry for being so brief and uh, fast, but our time is very limited. Another initiative is uh, what was called a space pass, like uh, foot in football, when you pass the ball. It was done in 2018, um, in the year when, where, when we had the uh, World Football Cup. And back then, uh, what we did was um, we sat together every year and we um, had a brainstorm. We would have a brainstorm about significant events that are going to have to take place this year. So we did this brainstorm in 2018, and we we realized that uh, we were going to have a football cup this year, and uh, it was an extremely successful campaign because uh, during the football cup in Russia, 98 percent of all the visitors were international visitors, and only 2% were Russian. It never happened before. What we did was uh, we printed the photos of our uh, cosmonauts on postcards, and we asked people to uh, say the name of this cosmonaut um, and uh, to make a short video and send it to us. So a museum, a space museum is a center of the field, and then uh, the ball, the imaginary ball, flies to Spain or Portugal or Colombia or whatever. So it's like a space pass. And all those people in all, all those countries posted those uh, short videos with 122 Russian cosmonauts, 244 uh, football fans who came to Russia from different countries made those short videos and posted them in their countries. So it didn't really take much of our time or effort, but it helped to raise the awareness about the museum among the international audience. And again, uh, we, we submitted this project uh, for an award, and uh, that's another way to go. And that's another way to uh, raise awareness about yourselves. And um, in our case, many media outlets uh, wrote about this campaign, and uh, so it was a great success. Do I have time? I have a couple of more minutes. That's probably the most fantastic project that we did when uh, while I was working in the museum. The project was about finding the recipients of postcards that were returned to sender. We got 18 postcards that were sent by uh, the Soviet cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov, 18 postcards that were returned to sender, to Komarov. Uh, they were sent 50 years ago, and uh, people never received them. And uh, they were given to us as an exhibition item. And we 
when we saw this, you know, people working in marketing and PR think uh, differently. And uh, when we saw those postcards, we started thinking. We, we saw the address, we saw the name of the recipient, all the data was there, but for some reason, uh, those post postcards were never sent or never received. And we asked, can, can we can we not exhibit, instead of exhibiting those post postcards, can we actually find the intended recipients who for some reason didn't get them 50 years ago? And I'm, I'm even as I speak this right now, I'm having goosebumps. Uh, this was done not for publicity's sake. Uh, we really just wanted to do this to, to help people. And uh, I have uh, many other slides uh, that I don't have uh, time to show you. Uh, we reached out to the people on TV. And actually, all those 18 postcards were intended to be sent to Ufa in Bashkortostan. So we reached out to a TV station in Ufa and uh, we started geolocating those people in Ufa. And there was a post um, promoting that was promoted in Ufa, and there were 831,000 views for this post and uh, thousands of likes. And it, it got. Uh, uh, it wasn't like a snowball and uh, like an avalanche. Uh, people start, uh, started writing to us on social media uh, saying, yes, I actually know this person or I know how to find this person. It was extremely, extremely um, successful. And uh, this slide shows the geography of uh, addressees. Everything was covered on social media and on mass media. People were forwarding those posts and uh, sharing this on their uh, social feeds. And we managed to find eight, uh, 14 addresses out of uh, 18, 14 recipients. And then the government of Bashkortostan, Bashkiria, um, also joined in. And uh, it was decided, actually, to put up a, a memorial plaque on the wall um, where Vladimir Komarov, the cosmonaut, uh, uh, he, 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 Vladimir Kosma, uh, Komarov made only two flights. Uh, he died uh, during the second flight. So uh, there was a memorial plaque where Vladimir Komarov worked on, the, on this building uh, that was put as a result of this campaign. Now we, as a private space campaign, continue the company, continue working with the museum in a partnership, Success Rockets, uh, that's the name of the company. And this is a mutually beneficial cooperation. And um, recently there was an event held uh, in the museum, organized by us, about the musification of uh, space-related startups. This brings me to the end of my presentation because the moderator wants to uh, shut my microphone off, probably. Thank you. It was very interesting, but we need to move on. And Maria is our last speaker. She's uh, our old friend, and she represents uh, in a museum about 50 kilometers away from Moscow, quite far. Not all people from Moscow go there. And uh, some go just because I ask them to. And we uh, have an, a joint exhibition um, of uh, Sp Spanish artist Hestera, and it's going to be open for another week. And uh, this artist uh, use, uh, uh, he repaints famous artworks without the main characters. For instance, uh, Venice, Botticelli's Venice, uh, Venus without the Venus itself, herself. And it's quite interesting. Uh, so this is a regional museum, but it competes for visitors with Moscow. How did it happen? Thank you very much. I am happy that many regional museums joined us today. And I think my presentation would be more interesting for them. 
just two slides about our museum. Uh, we are located in Istra. It's a, a town near Moscow. It's quite picturesque. It's called Russian Palestine. Because it was founded by Patriarch Nikon. And uh, it has a monastery, New Jerusalem monast Monastery. And uh, it was founded 100 years ago. And uh, our museum was actually founded on the premises of the monastery. Uh, it uh, recently underwent reconstruction. And in 2014, our museum was relocated to this building. As you see, it's quite unusual. We are within a hill, uh, just not to spoil the landscape, because our building cannot be higher than the monastery walls. So uh, our archives uh, was moved to uh, moved to this building, and our first question was, what to do next? Uh, how can we tell people uh, just? Uh, uh, that we are not a museum within the monastery anymore, that we are like, one, like 300 meters away from the monastery. This was our first task. And this is how we addressed it. We knew that we wanted to find a niche for ourselves. We, want, we positioned ourselves as a secular museum. Although some of our exhibitions are religious, and we have an exhibition about the monastery. But we decided that, we'll, first of all, we'll speak about secular things. And uh, our strategy was right. Before the pandemic, we had uh, half a million visitors per year. But uh, right now, of course, it's different. How could we become secular when we were born religious? And because not all our exhibitions are religious, we understood that uh, we needed to make temporary exhibitions because we were not a famous museum. And to attract visitors, we needed to, to come out with a bang. First, for instance, we had a Durer exhibition, a Fabergé and Marc Chagall exhibition, so just some numbers. In 2017, we had uh, an exhibition of Pablo Picasso. Uh, we, we had 15,000 visi visitors. Then Custodiev, a bit more. Then uh, Fabergé exhibition, 62,000. And uh, Marc Chagall's uh, exhibition, uh, it was 2019. And in March 2020, right before the lockdown, we managed to also to travel with it. I know that Picasso's exhibition in the Pushkin Museum was about 120,000 people. Uh, and uh, you are 50 kilometers away from Moscow, and your numbers are comparable. Yes. Art Newspaper Russia rated our exhibitions of Fabergé and Chagall as the most popular in regions of Russia. This uh, photo is from a recent exhibition of uh, Bruegel's. Uh, 90,000 people visited it during the pandemic with all the restrictions. Fortunately, without QR codes, but uh, many people couldn't come because uh, we had the sold out all tickets for the weekends, and some people could only travel on weekends. So it was a very successful exhibition. So uh, what did we use as a foundation of our new strategy? We knew that our projects must be interesting first for visitors and second to, for other museums, because we wanted to occupy a prominent place among other museums. Um, all our projects are uh, in collaboration with other museums. This is how we can communicate and uh, just to be active within the professional community. And at the same time, visitors get very unusual combinations of exhibitions. And uh, answering Lara's question about where is the place of marketing, my, my team is very fortunate. We have a good leader. In our museum, I think marketing starts everywhere, but uh, it's well, quite reasonable. I know that uh, my colleagues say that it's very bad when someone else prepares a product and then just forces it upon them. Uh, sometimes the content is not very clear, but they, the people just say, we must get visitors. But this is impossible to work with, 
people promoting a project must have a, a vote, must have a, their, their voice heard, otherwise it will not work. This is an example. Uh, this exhibition was called Color. Uh, it was the anniversary of Moscow region, 90 years of the establishment of the region. And uh, 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 so we assembled 90 uh, pieces from uh, from the region, from around the region, and uh, it was said the naming, uh, the name of the exhibition should be 90 pieces from 90 towns of the region. But we said it was a catastrophe. Uh, it shouldn't be called like that. Nobody will come. And we called it, at the end. We changed it. We called it color, and uh, just the subtitle was 90 masterpieces from the regions. Uh, so works were grouped by color, by the main, co main color. And we had some texts on the walls about the history of color or something like that. And it was as popular as Mark Chagall's exhibition. They were held simultaneously, but we saw many people, many more people returning to this exhibition. Some came two times, three times with the entire families. So it was quite emotional. And I think uh, regional museums should work in marketing of emotions. People uh, should get emotions when they come, so they will come back. We are quite a large museum, so 30,000 square meters, 10,000 square meters of exhibition space. Uh, we have an editor, an SMM specialist, uh, photographer, an editor. And me. So this is uh, this is our team, uh, this PR team. So we're quite small and not very costly. But what do we do? We completely own our PR campaigns. So we have the final say. We work with subcontractors, so working with banners and some um, ads, etc. But uh, still, we say what what goes. When we uh, launch a new PR campaign, it is always organized. We always asked, give us this uh, ahead of time, give us that. But we always coordinate everything. And it works uh, because our ratings show that uh, this is the right way. We have some media partners. And this photo shows our awards. Art Newspaper Russia shortlisted us two years in a row. So th this year we were top three, but uh, St. Petersburg's Manege won. When visitors started coming in, we started studying them. I think it is strategically important for any regional museum to see where these people are coming from. And uh, we discovered that the, the majority of people coming to us are from Moscow. And uh, the last people who came are locals, those who live just beyond the fence. But mostly people from Moscow come. And we realized that our project must be on the same level with Moscow, just so people from Moscow would be interested. This is Konstantin Gorbatov exhibition. Uh, it, it is currently opened. We have the largest collection of his works. And over 10 other museums sent his works from their collections to us. So it's quite a large exhibition. What did we emphasize? We are very thorough with our feedback. We track it through all social media accounts. And uh, we also have a page on Yandex. So uh, we believe that we must not have an unanswered comment. Sometimes people write just uh, some really senseless stuff uh, and uh, just unreasonable negative comments. But still, we must understand why. So this comment must have an answer so that any person or would just see it. Because people, when people uh, try to find some reviews, they first read the negative ones. And uh, uh, so we answer all the negative reviews, so pe other people would, would see, OK, someone wrote some negative stuff, but uh, the museum answered, and answered very reasonably, and uh, promised to do better, or maybe ad addressed it in some way. And it works for our image. 
Just you have to wrap up because our time is up. That's a pity. I must say this thing. We were an exhibition complex, but we realized that it wasn't uh, the right strategy because our our own archives are very large. It's uh, 190,000 items. So we became a museum, so uh, we underwent rebranding. This is our merchandise. It's not for sale yet. We also um, strengthened our uh, academic department. These are exhibitions from estates. And a few words about marketing. A regional museum must have very strong motivation. If you are 50 kilometers away from Moscow, exhibitions are not enough. Everything must be very comfortable for the visitor. This is our. This is why our reception area is new. We are planning to have a restaurant, so that everything is convenient. Uh, we also have uh, inclusivity programs. All our frontline employees underwent training courses. We have a ch children's center. Very interesting. It is about the Moscow region. But it's called Expanarium, and uh, it is interesting for everybody. And the, the last thing is about events. We realized that we can do more than just exhibitions. And this uh, year we had the fifth uh, musical uh, festival on our premises, and we are going to continue this tradition. Around us there are many summer houses, dachas, and uh, we want to attract these people as well. And again, we are a museum that communicates. We are always open for communication. And uh, uh, this is the final stage of our rebranding of this piece. Next uh, week, we are going to open this uh, mural. We uh, stripped uh, the building from of its cover, and we gave it to street artists so that they could paint something on them. We want people to just realize that we are special as soon as they enter. I have to close our session. The time flew by. I think uh, you will agree with me. Thank you very much to our wonderful speakers. Wait, wait, no applause. Just half a minute yet. I hope that uh, maybe people will uh, approach you with questions uh, through social media. The topic of our today's discussion was uh, marketing in museums, new effective solutions. Last night, my friend and director of New Uringoi Museum said, you have a wrong topic. You should call it marketing in uh, Moscow museums. But I hope my friend saw us today and he saw that he was wrong. Our today's topic was not just about museums of capitals, uh, but also about regional museums. And uh, thank you very much to all the visitors, all our viewers online. Thank you to organizers. Thank you to Alona, Dasha. See you next time at uh, Culture 2.0. Thank you very much. Просветительский проект «Культура онлайн» — это портал о культурных инициативах в интернете. Он знакомит аудиторию с инновационными онлайн-проектами из регионов России и других стран. Российский фонд культуры в сотрудничестве с Санкт-Петербургским международным культурным форумом создал эту площадку для всех, кто интересуется и профессионально занимается культурой и искусством, а также хочет создавать свои проекты в сети. Ведь опыт других авторов и советы специалистов могут помочь и подтолкнуть к воплощению новых креативных идей.
предпосылкой к созданию ресурса послужило вручение премии «Культура онлайн» в 2020 году. На соискание премии были выдвинуты российские цифровые проекты, которые активно создавались в период пандемии. Строгие ограничения изменили традиционный формат работы учреждений культуры. На премию было подано большое количество ярких, насыщенных и оригинальных цифровых проектов. Это привело организаторов к идее собрать их в одном месте и постоянно пополнять коллекцию. На старте портал представляет свыше 230 цифровых культурных проектов. Мобильные приложения, онлайн-спектакли, виртуальные выставки, трансляции концертов, подкасты, блоги о культуре и многое другое. День Победы – это шедевр шедевров, это император этих песен. Вот. И я очень рад, что именно мы это сделали. Я очень доволен результатом и, в общем, горжусь, что это мне пришлось в этом серьезно поучаствовать. И что это получилось. Очень хорошие отзывы. Вся страна объединилась. На самом деле замещение какой-то образовавшейся пустоты. Потому что, как вы знаете, концертные залы закрылись. И, в общем, вдруг остановилась концертная деятельность. Театры, филармонии. А люди стремятся к этому. Важность именно в том, что не утонула сама культура, сама музыка. Культура онлайн объединяет уникальный опыт сотен цифровых проектов из самых разных областей культуры. Новые идеи и формы призваны вдохновлять авторов и способствовать цифровизации культуры и развитию креативных индустрий. Информационная поддержка портала поможет уже существующим проектам обрести новую аудиторию. Блог – это один из самых доступных, популярных и прогрессивных способов рассказывать о культуре в сети. В связи с ограничениями, которые ввели в начале 2020 года, к этому формату обратились многие культурные учреждения и самостоятельные авторы. Так, в период самоизоляции Музей изобразительных искусств имени Пушкина первым из музеев поддержал международную акцию «Изоизоляция» – самый масштабный интернет-флешмоб, посвященный изобразительному искусству. 
доцент Южного федерального университета, публицист и популяризатор этнографии Жанна Андреевская решает с помощью блога актуальную задачу, сохраняет и поддерживает национальную культурную самобытность. На сегодня в ее блоге накоплено более 700 публикаций, объединенных темой «Культура России». Информация подается так, что читатели с интересом вступают в дискуссию с автором и друг с другом. Крымский литературно-художественный мемориальный музей-заповедник ведет свой блог так, как это мог бы делать сам Антон Чехов. Интересные факты о жизни писателя и его семьи, письма, кулинарные рецепты и модные советы, а также заметки об уникальных экспонатах музея и анонсы выставок. Важно то, что мы в такой нестандартной форме не только просвещали нашу аудиторию, но и стремились заинтересовать молодое поколение, донести мысль, что музей, особенно литературный музей, это не скучно. Когда уже наши двери были открыты для посетителей, то приходили люди, которые узнавали наших сотрудников, принимавших участие в съемках, которые благодарили нас за этот труд. И самое главное, многие э, из посетителей пришли именно к нам, потому что они узнали о нашем музее благодаря этому видеопроекту. Поэтому можно считать, что цель просвещать аудиторию и приглашать нами была достигнута. Музей, в первую очередь, это для людей и про людей. Соответственно, тот контент, который нужно было выпускать, он должен был быть доступным и понятным. Он должен был быть и интересным, а не просто превратиться в школьный урок, и ты сидишь, смотришь, ждешь, когда же будет перемена. Нет, это должно было быть общение на равных. Во время пандемии портал «Культура РФ» не только стал главной онлайн-площадкой для учреждений культуры по всей стране, но и освоил ТикТок – самую популярную социальную сеть наших дней. Это первый аккаунт о культуре на русскоязычной платформе. На сегодня блок «Культурно» насчитывает более 120 тысяч подписчиков. Задача проекта – рассказывать факты о культуре в коротком развлекательном и образовательном формате. В период ограничений в марте 2020 года сотрудники старейшего музея России запустили СММ-проект «Говорит и показывает Кунсткамера». Основными его площадками стали аккаунты музея во всех популярных социальных сетях. Проект предлагает истории об уникальных экспонатах и о праздниках в культурах народов мира, рассказы о судьбах известных ученых прошлого, экспедициях и исследованиях нынешних научных сотрудников музея. Так совпало, что «Говорит и показывает Кунсткамера» зазвучал как канал. Мы бы хотели, чтобы он стал полноценным нашим каналом в, вот в эту нелегкую пору пандемии. А вообще это способ самовыражения. Мы бы хотели делать его очень мобильным, многогранным. У нас идут репортажи из-за рубежа, у нас онлайн-экспозиции, онлайн-экспедиции. У нас используются эти же средства, допустим, в путешествии вокруг света, в ночь кунсткамеры, в ночь музея, вернее. Одним словом, диапазон и жанровый потенциал огромен, поэтому мы считаем, что он будет жить. Московские библиотекари создали собственный портал, на котором рассказывают обо всем, что интересует современную молодежь, и помогают разобраться в нюансах современной культуры. Проект «Культурь» задумывался как сайт со статьями про культуру и книги и анонсами городских событий. Статьи пишут библиотекари, а основной канал продвижения – социальная сеть ВКонтакте. Культурные блоги охватывают самую разную аудиторию. Так команда школы ведущих «Про Говори» вместе с учениками активно работают над своим YouTube-каналом, на котором публикуют позитивные познавательные видео. В кадре здесь только дети. Если вы ведете свой блог о культуре и искусстве, расскажите о нем на сайте Культура Онлайн.